There we go. Now my mouth is moving and now you can hear me, right? I hope. So everybody, hey Lee, there you are. <clears throat> hey. Hey there, see you guys. Good to talk to you and meet you last week. Caitlin, Rosa, or Emma, um, if you're there, I'd love to have you have your cameras on just so we can pretend it's kind of like classroom style. I would love it, love it, love it if you could do that. Because what we're going to do today is, oh, thank you, Caitlin. Yay. Right, it helps me feel less lonely in my COVID pod where I live. Right, it's only been my dogs and my, my sweetie. Her Ro Rosa, does your uh, camera work well enough? Do you have enough connectivity to make the camera go as well? And same with you, Emma. Does it work out okay? Sometimes it does, but I've had issues in the past, and it usually okay. just like shuts down, so I oh, try not to use it. I get that, Emma. All right. I get that 100%. So, um, How's everybody? Any initial logistical questions about the class or anything? You saw that there's going to be three chapters in total for assignment one. The first due date for assignment one is September 12th. Please don't wait till the last minute assignment. The thing that's due September 12th is the discussion post and replies. And then two days after that, September 14th is when the actual written or uploaded podcast or video is going to be um, due. Does that sound good? All right. <clears throat> and what I'm going to be doing today, tomorrow, and Thursday is uploading the rest of the lectures, the rest of the recorded lectures onto the questions and material page for you. Okay, so I've been having a very slow takeoff. I hope that's um, appealing to you all. I know some of you want to just hit the ground running, and I understand that too. So today we're going to start off with talking about the Aztecs otherwise known as the Mexica. And we'll do this for the next like hour and 15 minutes and I'm recording it and I'll upload it for the, your fellow students who couldn't make it today. What do you all know about the Aztecs? Any old thing, the Aztecs otherwise known as the Mexica, this um, ancient and also current folks who live in central Mexico. Rosa, Emma, Caitlin, or Lee, what do you, what comes to mind when you think Aztec? Excellent infrastructure. Oh yeah, they had infrastructure. We're talking about infrastructure quite a lot in our day and age in modern America and the Aztecs did infrastructure. Um, Emma, can I pick on you? What's, what comes to mind when I talk about the Aztecs to you? Um, just their like architecture, just the huge structures that they built. Yeah, it wasn't quite the cyclopedian architecture, that means there's really big rocks, that the Inca did, but it was impressive canals, pyramids, ball courts, we'll, you'll see images of those soon. Um, Rosa, how about yourself? What strikes you when, when I say the word Aztec or the Mexica as they call themselves? And Rosa, if you can't, um, you can feel free to type. Do you all see the Zoom chat thing over here? Rosa introduced herself over there. Feel free to type it out, Rosa. I might be mixing them up with the Mayans, but they didn't have a vast empire. Yes, indeed, both the Maya and the Aztec had vast empires. They were substantial, they were different, of course, uh, similar, different, but yes. And the Maya were a little earlier than the Aztecs. Thank you, Caitlin. All right, sorry, can I ask that again? Yeah, Rosa, when I say Aztecs, what comes to mind? San Diego State, the San Diego State mascot is the Aztec. Mexico, exactly, Mexica. Mexico actually comes from the word that the Aztecs called themselves, the Mexica. All right, so let's start. Um, doing, doing, doing. Not that. <clears throat> so here we are. Um, lecture Mexica, also known as the Aztecs. Actually, the term Aztec is an invention of 19th century European, this one European historian in the 19th century wrote a book called them the Aztecs and the name stuck. So once again, um, naming is power and who writes history, you know, reflects power. So if you went around Tenochtitlan where they're from in 1500 and say, hey, yo, where do the Aztecs live? Nobody'd know what you're talking about. 
<clears throat> this is the question. I think it's question two on the assignment. Let me just show you what we're going to be dealing with today. Here's the questions and materials for assignment one. If you scroll down through the boring yet important directions, question number one asks you about this Mexico's language and population. And then question number two is what we're going to be dealing with for the next hour. What strikes you about the Mexica or Aztec migration south? What strikes you about their culture and society? And then what strikes you about their influence on native North American Indians? Okay. And I already uploaded the PDF slides. So if you just want to look at the wonderful slides at your leisure, they are posted right here. And by the way, anytime any of y'all have any questions for me, just stop me, raise your hand, yell out. I can't see you raising your hand like in a traditional lecture hall. So um, please just holler. Oh, by the way, a note. The Mexica people speak and wrote and still write Nahua. Nahua or Nahuatl is the name of their language. Okay, just to get some terminology. So Nahua or Nahuatl, depending on who you're asking, is the language they spoke. And by the way, you all know um, a few Nahua or Nahuatl words already. Does anybody know uh, everyday words we use here in California, North American and English that come from Nahua? What do you call those uh, wild dogs that eat little puppies and that eat poodles? Coyotes. Coyotes, coyote. Coyote is a Nahua word. Yep. Uh, what about those yummy fruits with the big pit in it that you smear on toast and put a little garlic, salt, and whatever you do with it? What's that called? The green fruit with the big pit you smear on toast. Oh, so yummy. What's that? Anna, you know, you probably love them up. Anybody know? What's do you that? mean avocado? Avocado. Avocado is a Nahua word and it comes from Mexico. We call it avocado or avis, as my surfing buddies say, avis. Yeah, avocado. And finally, the last example, uh, one of those yummy things I grow in my backyard that are red and I have to get the worms off of them and squeeze them with the big old hooks on them. What are those red yummy fruits that are happening right now? Tomatoes. Tomato, tomato. So, coyote, aguacate, tomato. Those are three Nahua words that we've incorporated and borrowed from. That's the beauty of the English language. Um, sorry to interrupt. I'm going to try to zoom in through my phone so that I, my audio can work. All right, Rosa, no problem. All right, back to this. I don't know if we uh, speak any Finnish words in our everyday parlance, do we, Lee? I doubt it. Oh, I can't hear you, Lee. Oh, sorry, I forgot to hold that. Um, yeah, there's only one uh, notable Finnish word in the... Oh, you went out again. What's the notable Finnish word? Uh, you went out again, Lee. Oh, well. Yeah, uh, it's sauna. It's the... Oh. Oh. Yeah, it's the uh, English pronunciation of the word sauna, which is, you yeah. know, the okay. steam, get it. steam room. Okay. That seems like something people in Finland would uh, be doing when it's- Oh yeah, there's one in every house, like literally. That's kind of nice. All right, so hey, let us begin again, stop me. Um, and again, for these questions, what strikes you about Mexica Aztec migration south? Simply answer it in a few sentences and back it up with evidence and go to the next one. What, strike you, what strikes you about their culture and society? And then what strikes you about their influence on Native North Americans? And I will cover all of this today. Hello, you are back. We can see you and hear you. Wonderful. Hello. Hello, yeah, uh, Yadira. Am I pronouncing your name Yadira. right? Yadira. Yes, it's Rosa, but I go by Yadira. Got you. I will call you whatever you want. I don't care what government calls you, <laughs> right? You just tell me what you want to be called. And you Yadira all would be nice. Thank you. Yeah, feel free to call me Chris. Okay. <laughs> Or when I taught in Mexico, you can call me, they called me profe, either one, I don't care. Okay. So one of the main themes of this class is going to be the history of migrations. Us humans, ever since 200,000, well, since 65,000 years ago, when the first humans started to, their slow walk out of Africa, we've been migrating ever since. Interestingly, it's your generation right now, the uh, 21st century Americans, that have migrated least in our, at least in our national history. 
So humans, we move around, right? Whether we're escaping climate change as they were here or escaping war or just looking for greener pastures. Um, the first American migrants to what we call North America came between 10 and 20,000 years ago. Interestingly, a lot of recent evidence is um, coming to show that many also crossed the ocean, right? It wasn't just over this Beringia land bridge down in here, but it was also in ocean bound vessels. So that's really cool. You know what us humans brought with us? Uh, what are our people's best friend? You probably see it in the next one. So hey, let me just back up for reference. Can you see my whole screen, the PowerPoint thing? Yes. Okay, cool. We also brought dogs. So the first migrants over brought their um, dogs from Asia, right? I like this image because this one looks a lot like my dog. And I like to think, oh, my dog's part Native American, un mestizo, una mestiza. Mestiza is just a term meaning mixed people. So dogs also came over. Here's like the Siberian Husky looking thing. Here's a little Chihuahua, right? And here's just a derpy sweet looking dog. Um, today, currently, oh, let me let Carol in. There, Carol, come on in and join us. Currently, of all the dogs in North America, according to scientists who study dogs, I don't know what they would be called, um, about 30% of the dogs in North America have um, elements of Asiatic genes or this migration over. Okay, so it's still why the majority 70 are your, um, you know, genotypes from Europe, 30% of the original dogs still are here. All right, historians, my gosh, why do us historians always have to like do a long wind up? Well, I like it because it gives me just a perspective about where I am. So this is how I like to teach history, right? Go broad and then get as specific as possible by the end. And that's my goal um, today and in other lectures. So if you take a snapshot in 1492, the year Columbus sailed the ocean blue, the earth had about 500 million people, 500 million, give or take in 1492. Do you know how many humans there are in the world today? What's, who knows the approximate number of humans on our little blue dot? 7.6 billion maybe, 7.8 maybe now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, about almost eight Bs, eight billion. We are, well, not if the coronavirus has anything to do with it, right? Oh, that's a bad joke. Is it too early for COVID jokes? Never. Never, Susana Distancia. Oh, uh, go ahead and Google Susana Distancia. It's the Mexican cartoon superhero that teaches Mexicans to stay um, six feet away from each other, or oh, dos metros. Susanna Distancia is um, funny. So Earth, 500 million. The Americas had about 60 million people. When I say Americas, that's from, right, way up here in Alaska all the way to Argentina. These are the Americas, right, Americas. If you ask people in the rest of the world, where are the Americas, they would point to this whole thing. If you ask people in Bernie, where's America, they would say right here. Okay, sorry, Bernie, I don't mean to pick on so mean. All right, 25 million people w uh, lived in this area we call Mesoamerica. Mesoamerica is just Greek for Middle America. And not shocking, this is the middle part of the Americas, this skinny little part here. 25 million people live there. Okay. <clears throat> um, about, anyway, that's about 5 million people in what is today North America. And I could go on, but that would just be on and on and on. Check out this cool map. This is one, I love maps, but I will, this is probably the second to last one I'll show you because other people just roll their eyes and are so boring. So this is an ethno-linguistic map that maps the, cult, the linguistic diversity of Mexico in about 1500. In other words, each little different color represents a different language being spoken. Sure, there were related groups, like all the purples, they were kind of related, just like English is related to German, is related to Italian, right? The English language is this uh, Latin Germanic fusion plus all these other elements. Um, the green groups are the Maya group of languages, right? The bluish groups are the Uto-Aztecans. The same language 
Native peoples were speaking in Salt Lake City at this time in Utah, Uto, that's Utah, and that um, was related directly to the language the Mexica or the Aztec people were speaking down in um, where they were, Central Mexico, right in here. So just give me some feedback so I don't feel like I'm a crazy man talking to my computer alone. What strikes you about this map? Anybody? Emma, Carol, Yadira, Caitlin, Lee? I suppose just linguistically, they were just super diverse. Like obviously there was overlap in like themes and like the way they talked about stuff, but there was a huge variety in languages too. Big time, huge variety in languages. Thank you, Emma. And also many folks were bilingual. How do you get along living with all these other people? Well, you know that old joke, what do you call somebody who speaks three languages? What's the, what's the term? Multilingual? Yeah, or trilingual, right? What do you call somebody who speaks two languages? Bilingual. Bilingual and somebody who speaks one language? American. Yeah, you've heard that joke. Or Australian, or French. Okay, all right, enough of that. Um, just to show you that the uh, linguistic diversity continues to this day, even though the majority of folks who live in what is today Mexico and the Southwest uh, speak Spanish, right? I think over 50% of the current California population speaks Spanish, right? So we can call California just far northern Mexico. I do. Um, look at Mexico's population in 2016. About 75% identify themselves as mestizo. And again, remind me what mestizo means. What does that cool word mean? You can either type it out in the chat thingy or just tell me. Mix. Mix the ancestry. Mix, mix. And it means any kind of mix. Uh, you traditionally it's European mixed with native people, but it just means mixed. Mezclar is to mix in Spanish. 5% uh, Afro mestizo, 10% identifies indigenous, and 10% identifies 100% 100% European. However, look at the native languages that are still spoken in Mexico. Um, there's just a lot of language you don't, the reason I put this, all these names, is just so you get an idea of the number of different languages, okay? I lived for three years doing my dissertation work in the Zapotec area of Southern Mexico. So there was Zapotec spoken, there was Nahuatl spoken, there was Mije spoken, right? Purepecha, that is the, from Tarasca, from Guerrero. I know, I think a couple of the students are from Guerrero and the Purepecha is the native language spoken, the primary one spoken in Guerrero. So I show you this just to share with you the fact that people in Mexico are still speaking their indigenous languages. Sure, there might just be a couple old folks over here speaking Ijil, right? But they're still around. Um, 2.4 million people in Mexico still speak Nahuatl, right? Still speak the Nahuatl language. You can you still hear it if you go to the markets in uh, rural areas of Mexico. It's, yeah. Does it do any of these languages have like a official uh, status in any states or is it kind of like an America situation? Great question. Uh, somebody Google if you can, uh, Mexico's official language. I don't think Spanish is the official language, but that's a great question. So why don't uh, one of you all uh, Google it, Googlealo, as they say. You can have a Google up. I just Google official Mexican language. I, my guess is the Spanish is not. That's my guess. So talking about empires, this is what uh, Yadira mentioned earlier. Um, History often talks about and then this empire and then that empire and I know we just can't get away from it because it's a convenient way to sort of group things in order to wrap our heads around. But don't think of this empire like anything like a uh, like the Roman Empire is much, much different. So a group of Maya different. This is kind of like the UN, right? They kind of agreed to um, be allies for a while right, between about 200 and 900 control this area, the Yucatan Peninsula. But we're gonna start off focusing on the Aztecs or the Mexica, and this is there, the purple outline is the extent of their control. Um, and their control varied from place to place, but this is just a little map, okay? <clears throat> you know, it's interesting, 
for me anyway, the main concentration of people living in Mexico in 1500 was right in here. Look at the Mexican population density in 2010. Where do the majority of Mexicans still live? Right, right in the same place, right? So this really dark spot, this very densely populated area is one of the biggest cities in the world, Mexico City. It's right in here, my hometown. I was born there decades ago, Mexico, Mexico City. And there it is. You know what would change of this map if you looked at a 2020 version of this? More people would be living on the border. The border is one of the fastest growing areas and we're gonna be focusing on that quite a bit come the later part of the semester. Questions, comments so far? Should I just keep on rolling? You all good? I just Googled the official language of Mexico. Mm -hmm. It says Spanish language, mixed tech, mixed tech. Zapotec, no. na, actual, or how do you say that? Nahua, Nahua, Nahuatl. N Nahuatl and Yucatec, Mayan. That's interesting. Yeah, when I was uh, looking it up, it seems like it's a kind of a similar situation with America where Spanish is the de facto official language, but apparently according to an act passed in 2003, um, anyone can use uh, any of the indigenous languages there to communicate with the government. Okay. And that they have the right to request documents in their language, Okay. which is pretty cool. Yeah, and again, hey, you're all my faves, I love you. But you know what, as a historian, I don't trust anybody, especially I don't trust Google stuff, so I'm gonna look it up too, right? It's always good to check sources. Don't trust me. Oh, are you seeing my screen? No, you're not. There. So that's interesting. So Yadira mentioned that Nahuatl or Nahua, Yucatec Maya and Zapotec are, according to your source, the three official languages. And then Lee piped in with saying, hey, if you're Mihi in the mountains of Oaxaca, and if you want a government ballot, you can get it in your language, Mihe. That is cool to know. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, so any questions or should I move on? Keep going. I had a quick question, actually. Yeah, go for it. Um, a lot of the indigenous groups up in the plains developed like a plain sign language. Do you happen to know if there's any like universal sign language that they would have used? I don't know, but my, I have not heard that. I do not know. That is, I didn't know about the plain sign language. Oh, that's cool. Um, please, I, you know what, I, again, I'm gonna admit, I don't have much of a social life anymore since this whole COVID thing, especially COVID with ash particulates. So uh, send me cool links and things, and if they pertain to class, I'll share them with the class and maybe offer them for extra credit, okay? Cool. All right. <clears throat> So let me tell you, um, the Mexica tell themselves this story. For them, this is their origin story. Just like for many um, Christian Jews and Muslims, Genesis is their origin story, right? Us historians say, hey, where are the facts for that? Never mind that. Right now, I'm just going to talk to you about um, the legend of what they tell themselves, where they came from. And it actually, just like a lot of origin stories, there's element of um, historical veracity in there. In other words, historians can say like, oh, okay, that kind of happened that, you know, we can't prove it. So I'm gonna tell you their Mexica origin story. And again, Mexica are the same as Aztecs. <clears throat> so in about 1046, 1064, and by the way, the, Az the Aztec and Mexica stories are very specific with dates because, well, when you're specific with dates, what does that mean? What tool do you have in your cultural inventory if you're very specific with exact dates? Astronomy. They have a calendar, right? And they read the stars and they read astronomy. Um, the Maya and the Aztec and all the Mesoamericans had a very sophisticated sense of um, calendrics and astronomy, which I'll get to in a second. Chico Mostoc, Chico Mostoc, the place of the seven caves, seven. Um, according to them in 1064, these deity humans emerge from the caves. And here's an image of it because the Aztecs and the Mesoamericans also had writing. Their writing was pictographic and phonetic. This is phonetic when you spell something out, mashika, that's called phonetic writing, that's what we use. But we also use pictographs. 
if you go to a bathroom stall and you see a stick figure with a triangle and a non-stick figure, at least until they get rid of all that silliness, um, you know which bathroom you may want to go in or might want to avoid. So here's the place of the seven caves and you see them emerging, these feet meaning like they're walking out, okay? And what's interesting is anthropologists and historians went and said, hey, let's go see where they said they came from. Are there any caves? And sure enough, there's some caves. Don't worry, I'm not sitting here think, um, arguing to you that yes, all the Aztec origin story, there's historical veracity, there's not right? But there are elements of, of um, truth to it. Here's a bunch of caves. And this part of the world, um, the place of the seven caves, is right up here. It's in northwestern Mexico, southwestern United States, the borderlands area. So Atzlan means the place of the water heron. And this is where they said they came from. They came from Atzlan. And if you went to this area, this is like the agricultural um, hub of Mexico. If you go to Sinaloa, this is where my grandfather's from, from um, the capital of Sinaloa. Today, unfortunately, Sinaloa is, mo is known mostly for what? What do you all hear about when you hear about Sinaloa? Drugs. Drugs, right? The Sinaloa cartel, Chapo Guzman, and all that. Well, because these mountains are very rugged, rugged, their soil is rich, and um, so there's also drugs. We will be talking about drug, the drug trade, the drugs and arm trade in the last portion of the class. Actually, the drug and arm trade started in like the 1930s, but more on that later. <clears throat> so their story is that they migrated from Atzlan all the way down to Tenochtitlan, the place of the cactus. And Tenochtitlan today is Mexico City, right? This is where Yep. So they did this long 1,000, 1,500 mile migration. It took them decades. And they wrote about it, just like um, other people's write about their history. Okay, this is their writing. If you were able to read <clears throat> um, Nahuatl, you'd be able to read these glyphs, right? These are place glyphs, both pictogram, I'm sorry, both phonetic and um, pictures. Right here, you can see this is in Spanish. This writing here. So what this tells us historians is that, oh, the Aztecs were explaining to the Spanish what this means. Because the Spanish were like, hey, Mr. and Mrs. Mexica, uh, what does this mean? Well, let me help you out here. So they made it bilingual. So it's pretty cool. So this is a bilingual, right, history of them crossing this river into where they migrated to. <clears throat> cool, huh? Again, questions, comments, I already posted these slides. So if you wanna watch these without watching me blabber on, um, the slides are already posted. So this, wow, 2,500, man, it just shows you the size of it. So almost the length, the breadth of the United States, the United States is about 3,000 miles across. This is 2,500 mile migration in 300 years. So don't get the idea they woke up every morning like, hey honey, you know, grab the kids and grab the chihuahuas and let's go south. No, it took them a long time. And on their journey south, they met with other peoples, they feuded with other peoples, they played with other peoples, they made love and had kids with other peoples, right? So their culture changed as they migrated south, this 300 year long migration into where they eventually settled into Mexico City. And by the way, the historical record matches their legend of their migration, right? <clears throat> Um, has anybody heard the term Atzlan in different contexts? Atzlan, is that a term that rings a bell to you all? It's okay if it doesn't. No, nope, this isn't the 1960s Berkeley, is it? All right. So if we were in Berkeley in the 1960s, or heck, in 1971 at the University of Washington, the Chicano movement, the Mexican-American movement, uh, just like the African-American movement, the gay movement, the um, um, all kinds of women's movement, etc. Mexican Americans had a movement and a lot of it was predicated on, hey, we matter too. And how did they define that they matter? They say, we are Atzlan. We come from this distinguished and um, very diverse and sophisticated group of people called the Aztecs. And you know what? Their home was right in the southwestern part of the United States, right where we come from. 
So in other words, it was a point of pride. So many Chicano activists embraced this, I'm from Atlan, or we are Atlan. This will be the subject when we talk about the 1950s civil rights movement. Okay, I'm just showing you the historical roots of the word Atlan. So according to the Mexica, uh, their god Huitzilopochtli guided them. Oh, and by the way, if you all are ever at uh, Zoom dinner parties or however you all interact, with, if you can just have these Nahuatl words ring off your tongue, ooh, you're gonna get some, right, social points. Huitzilopochtli is their, one of their main gods. And according to the Aztecs, he guided them. He guided them to the promised land. Okay. I just like that. Uh, and um, again, the, As the Mesoamericans were uh, one of five cultures to invent from scratch a written language. This is an example of the Maya written language. It's different, but there are similarities. Just like English is different than ancient Phoenician, there are similarities. This is where we got our written language from the Phoenicians way back. Okay, I won't bother you with that. Um, you know who's going to be on the list pretty soon about folks who had a, I don't want to say a written language, but a, a, a language that they recorded are the Inca. The Inca in South America recorded names and dates and accounts on these in different colored strings with um, knots in it. Really cool. I'm talking about that in my history three class. So I'm just plugging my history three class if you want to join it next semester. Back to this. <clears throat> so the Mexica um, were nomadic. That's a word that counts. They know they walked through these different neighborhoods of peoples. But as you can imagine, not everybody wanted this big old group of people rolling on through. So they also got really good at fighting. Right, of course they got good at diplomacy, but once in a while you, things got violent, right? So they'd be, um, historians call them nomadic warriors going south. I don't want you to have this idea that they were always like grunting and groaning like some people think the Mongols on their horseback. Oh, but there was no horses yet, no horses. So the Mexica grew in numbers, migrated south past the Tarahumara, past the Zacatecs and others down into the south. Um, one of the Mesoamerican weapons, um, and mostly used for hunting, not really for warfare, was this, the atlatl. Has it, have any of y'all seen the atlatl before? This obsidian pointed spear with the little throwy thing that make, you can, they were so accurate. And even to this day, um, I know some folks who go hunting. They'll go hunting with an atlatl, right? Just to, you know, just to do it. <clears throat> A lot of folks who weren't the Mexica called them Chichimex. Those Chichimex are coming down. Um, this is a derogatory term, meaning it's not a nice thing to call somebody. Um, what does, does that word sound like anything you know? Kind of animal, is there an animal that sounds kind of like Chichi? Animal. A chinchilla? A chinchilla, great guess. <laughs> A chihuahua. A oh, chihuahua. awkward. Yeah, it's okay. I like chinchilla. You could have caught a, it could have got a lot more awkward. I opened that up a little too much, but it's okay. It's Zoom COVID life. Awkward's okay. So other people call them dog people, right? Because like, oh, look at those dog people coming in their furs and their bare feet and they stink. So they were not liked. Like many immigrants to foreign lands, right? We are not alone in our current history of not welcoming immigrants into lands, right? This is nothing new, unfortunately. So as the Mexica migrated slowly south into Mexico, uh, into Tenochtitlan, which will become Mexico City, Mexico City is a, um, about 7,500 feet in altitude in this bowl surrounded by volcanoes. These volcanoes are huge. This uh, Mount Itzasihuatl, uh, it means white woman in Nawa. And there's so many young women called Itzasihuatl. I have a cousin called Itzasihuatl, but we all call her just Itza. Mexicans also have a nickname for everything. Nothing's called what the government calls it. So Mount Itza, can you see how it's a, uh, a woman? Here's her head in their imagination. Here's her breast and her feet. Huge mountain. How tall is Mount Shasta? 
About 14,000 feet. 14. All right. This got over 3,000 feet on Mount Shasta. This is a huge, huge volcano. Right across from Mount Itzasiwatl is Popocatépetl. Um, Popocatépetl in Nahua means smoking mountain. And at least for three, at least for 500 years, it has been smoking. Some days it smokes less than others, some days more. Isn't that crazy? Smoking mountain. So I show you this just to, so you can get an idea of the landscape, right? And just the beauty. I'm a sucker for this hokey 1940s Mexico calendar art. I really am. Got one up in a garage, can't help it. So this is just an allegory of, right, here is the sleeping woman and here's Popocatapetl keeping the fires, um, keeping the fire stoked until she gets better. This is one of the stories that the Aztecs created explaining why there's the white sleeping woman and the fire's going. Here's a little inter um, artistic interpretation. I could go more into it because I'm a cultural historian. That's my specialty. Of course, I do the politics and the economics and all that, but my super interest is cultural history. So if you want to go meet with office hours with me and talk more about this, let me know. <clears throat> so in the 1300s, um, right as Europe's going through like their Middle Ages, their decentralized sort of medieval life, um, these folks arrive into the Valley of Mexico. This is what is today Mexico City, right? It already had one million inhabitants. It was the most densely populated place in the world besides Beijing. My friends who are Chinese historians and I, we kind of debate about which is bigger, who has more people, you know how guys are. So um, it's debatable which was the most densely and largest populated area, but it was huge. At this time, the biggest city in Europe was perhaps Paris, and it only had, I think, 20,000 people or maybe even less. It was nothing, right? This place, had, this place had 1 million people, mostly along the banks. Because this lake here is a saltwater lake, a lot like Lake uh, Salt Lake City, Salt Lake. But there is fresh water, agua dulce, that comes from the rivers all surrounding here. Okay, so saltwater lake, sweet water here. The people in Tlacopan, Tlacopan is right over there, and the people in Texcoco, these were the big powers of the day, they did not like when these migrants came in, right? I can picture them saying, build the wall, build the wall, we don't want those migrants here. We don't know if they said that. So what jobs do you think the, the migrants took, right? They're new in town, nobody likes them. What jobs do you think they could take? Go ahead. I'm, this is my sneaky way of just being tired of my voice and wanting to hear your wonderful voices. The worst ones. Yeah, they got really good. Oh, by the way, they settled on this island in the middle of the lake, right? Because it was very, well, it was safe because they weren't really welcomed. So they settled like in the hood, right? A place where nobody really wanted to go, right? Cheap real estate. So this is where they settled on this little island. They actually began as mercenaries. Remember I told you they got really good at fighting? So if you need to hire some heavies in order to like repay a loan or go attack your enemies, you'd hire some of these new Mexica folks who came in from the north, right, as your hired guns. This is an actual Aztec drawing of um, an Aztec warrior capturing somebody. And I don't know how, what the quality of the image is, but can you read that word in Spanish right there? Captivo, captivo, captive. So again, this, is, this shows you that later on when the Spanish arrived, the Spanish are like, what's going on, Mr. Aztec person? And they say, okay, that's a captive, captivo is the Spanish word. <clears throat> Slowly but surely, the Aztec, oh, I keep calling them Aztec, but Aztec, Mexica, I'm trying to change my head to call them the Mexica because that's what they call themselves, but I can't, I have to rewire my brain, right? It takes a long time, especially for us old parts. So their power grew slowly through marriages, through alliances, and through war. We're going to explore this image a lot further when we talk about um, Doña Isabela in a couple lectures from now. This is an um, image of an Aztec marriage ceremony for rich people. 
right? Poor people got married a lot more simply, right? This is an Aztec marriage ceremony image, and I'll explain a lot more of this later. Here's the, um, the woman, mujer, and the man, baron. You see the little words up there? <clears throat> so their power grew slowly through marriages and alliances with the ex existing families and through conquest. Okay, let me just, you don't need to know that right now. No, I don't know. And through conquest, right? And through military conquest. This is how states become powerful through marriage, alliance, and conquest. Look at the United States, look at Rome, look at others. <clears throat> However, Aztec warfare was different than, say, European warfare at the time. If you are, oh, we'll talk about that when we talk, oh, I brought it up. How did Europeans fight each other? If you could picture a field of battle in the 1500s, European armies coming and fighting each other, right? How does it work? Oh, well, they were fighting to kill. On the field of battle, right? Yep, they're on the field of battle, going after each other, chopping, chopping, sorting, sorting, all that stuff. The Aztecs, <clears throat> the Aztecs mostly took POWs, prisoners of war. Right, that they would later exchange for, um, that, that they would later enslave or exchange for POWs. However, if in, as in Mesoamerican warfare, if you captured an elite person, right, somebody who was a Jaguar warrior, an Ocelot warrior, their elite, ver their version of the Green Berets, you would bring him home. You would bring Mr. Elite Warrior home and have your priests ritualistically sacrifice them on the pyramid, right? Crazy stuff. More about this when we talk about Aztec versus Spanish fighting. And these elite military members who were captured, some of them were ritualistically eaten by members of the Aztec elite, right? Cannibalism was not part of their everyday food pyramid. Right, they did not have avocado, tomato, and human thigh. Right, no way. That was only for the elite in a very ritualistic way. Here's an image of the, the god Huitzilopochtli, and here's an image of the priests ritualistically eating an enemy. <clears throat> um, more on that. Oh, this is good. Oh, talk about that later. So this group, I'm introducing this group here, and go ahead and look at them and write them down or take a snapshot. Tlaxcalans, this odd name, Tlaxcalans. You're gonna be hearing a lot about them. They were the number one enemy of the Mexica. The Tlaxcalans lived right here, right next door, and they were never conquered by the Aztecs, right? They were the constant number one enemy of the Mexica. So, it's not so hard to guess. When the Spanish roll into town, who do the Spanish want as their number one allies against the Mexica? Come on, I'm being Captain Obvious. Emma, give it to me. The Tlaxcalans? Yeah, the Tlaxcalans are gonna be the number one ally of the Spanish against the Mexica, right? Because the Tlaxcalans have many memories of this. Ah, they took un Uncle Harold or Uncle Jose, and look what happened to Tio Jose. Right? Not good. So during this time in the Valley of Mexico, Tenochtitlan, I'll show you the name in a second, the, Ch uh, the Chichimex had this transformation, this extreme makeover from being nomadic folks in the north to being very sophisticated city slickers, right? That wore um, very sophisticated outfits. This, these are members of their elite military units, right? Here's, oh, who picked that? I don't want to, Tlaloc, here's the rain god, Tlaloc. Okay, so a priest dressed up as the rain god and others. This is how they rolled. Europe at this time had its own finery, right? And its own garb that the court wore, so did the Aztecs. And again, if you want to talk about any of this during office hour or afterwards, I'd be happy to. So in, 13, in 1324, a date that Mexicans still celebrate as the founding of Mexico City, the Mexica founded their capital, Tenochtitlan, the place of the cactus. And according to legend, they chose to live on this island because a, a, a raptor, 
right? A big raptor landed there and caught a snake in its claws, right? On a cactus, right? That's according to legend. So this has become the symbol of Mexico. Does this look familiar? Yeah, it's on the flag. Yeah, exactly. It's on the flag right there, right? The symbol of Mexico, the place where the eagle landed, eating the snake. Uh-oh, or is the snake going to bite back? On the cactus. Doesn't that sound like a lovely place to live, full of cactus, eagles, and snakes? There, here's a close-up. All right, no getting this tattoo. No extra credit for getting a tattoo of this. Oh, look at the tunas. These are yummy fruits on the prickly pear. Those are so yummy. Okay, back to this. So I could spend a whole lecture talking about this image right here. This reflects how the Aztec political system worked. Each quadrant of the city, right? They uh, divided the city into four quadrants, north, south, east, and west. They kind of called it different things. Was governed by a council. These two guys govern this area. These two guys govern this area. These two guys over there and those four guys over there, right? And this tells the brief story about how they captured this. And if you're able to read Aztecs, they will tell you the date. If you see these little dots and things, that tells you the date in which it happened. And it narrates the brief conquest of, and you read it clockwise this way. And it narrates the brief conquest of Tenochtitlan. Super, super cool, I think, anyway. Any questions about that before I go? No, Emma, Carol, Justin. Hey, Justin, are you there? Can you hear me? I'm here, but it's loud in the room we're in. Oh, I know. I'm just saying hi. That's all. And again, just chime in whenever. I get so tired of hearing my voice talk. So by 1519, I'm fast forwarding about 200 years. 1519 is the year that the Spanish and their native allies, along with Africans, came in and invaded the city. Tenochtitlan had 250,000 people living on this island. And by the way, this is an amazing very realistic painting by um, an artist who consulted a lot of historians and anthropologists to like, hey, how did it really look? Well, this is as best an idea as we can get how it looked on the eve of the Spanish conquest. Look at all that, one million people living in the surrounding basin. This right here is kind of like um, a levee that holds the water in or kind of holds the water in, right? These here, what do you suppose these are, these connecting things to the shore? What do you suppose these are? Emma, Carol, Justin, yeah. Roads. Sorry? Roads yeah, to get in and out. out. Yeah, byways, you're exactly right. What needs to get in and out? People and their goods and water. Remember, this water you cannot drink. It's brackish, it's salty, it's yucky. So um, they aqueduct, they brought water in like the Romans did to Rome, and they also had byways that brought people and their goods in and out. It's also very defensive. You could easily defend this. It's really incredible was how clean Tenochtitlan was considering its population. Like European cities would be 20,000 people and they'd have huge issues with uh, hygiene because of that, but uh, they had like such a good infrastructure. Yeah, do you know why um, things were so hygienic and clean in Tenochtitlan compared to European cities? In other words, what did people here do with their human waste? Can you guess? Chuck it in the back alley in the neighbor's house? What did Europeans do with human waste at this time? I'll throw it out the window, basically. Yeah, chuck it in the street. So could you imagine walking down the streets of London or Paris? Right? And there's just like, oh yeah, here comes the bucket. <clears throat> um, so, well, let me get a better picture. <laughs> let me go back to this. So these are a series, if you zoom in on this. Um, Mexico, well, their capital is a bunch of canals. There's a lot of canals connecting it. Uh, when the Spanish came, they called it Little Venice. So how you got around was through a shallow boat with somebody with a pole getting you around. So they had waterways everywhere. And at the end of every street, there was a canoe which had the outhouse and you went and did your business in the canoe, 
okay? And some noble civic worker's job was to go and take care of all the human waste. And then the human waste was, let me fast forward a little bit. The human waste was, uh, they put cal on top of it, C-A-L, oops. What's cal in English? Lime, L-I, lye. Lye killed the bacteria in the human waste, right? So it's good for fertilizer, but it, it kills the bacteria, so it's not gonna kill you. And they had chinampas. Chinampas is the Aztec word for urban farming. So they would farm a very intensive urban farming technique that utilized human sewage, irrigation, and they just had these little plots in the city, right? Because this is a very shallow lake. It's easy to fill it in and create land. And the, your first reading, Jeffrey Pilcher, Que Viven Los Tamales. Has anybody started that reading? The Jeffrey Pilcher, Que Viven Los Tamales? No? Okay, you're going to love it. I really think you're going to love it. Because the, the trinity of Mesoamerican food, like provides a complete diet, complete amino acids, is corn, oops, corn, beans, and squash. Maiz, you know, beans, and squash. And they grew them together. The corn would be, grown, uh, would be grown in the middle. The squash would be grown at the base of it because squash leaves are very big and they protect the ground from being dried out. And the beans would grow up the corn stalks because beans and all legumes provide um, nitrate to the soil. So it's a perfectly wonderful complementary way to have a complete protein and a diet. And what the Aztecs produced with this was a variety of foods, not just the Aztecs, everybody living in this area, from tomatoes to aguacatos, tomatoes and avocado, pumpkins, chilies, vanilla, vanilla, chocolate, chocatl. Oh my gosh, I didn't even mention chocatl. Chocolate comes from Mexico. Um, turkeys, they did um, eat meat in the form of turkeys, ducks, dogs. Yes, dog tacos were a thing. They were. And honeybees. Right, and this is just an example, an image of the various types of corn grow grown in the Americas, throughout the Americas. We're used to seeing this corn in the bottom, right? Many Mexicans jokingly call this pig feed, right? But there's such a variety of different corns grown and eaten in the Americas. Um, and you're going to learn all about this in the two chapters you're going to begin reading right after this exciting lecture. Um, you're reading chapter one, The People of Corn, that talks about Mesoamericans, and then chapter two, The Conquest of Wheat, and talking about when the Spanish came, how things changed. The book is, uh, I think, going to open up talking about the Mexica market. Still today, the biggest open-air market in the world is in right outside of Mexico City. Today, I think a million people go to that market every day, right? Still today, it's in, um, oh, I forget the name of the place, right outside of Mexico City. Back then, six, 60,000 people went to the market every day where you could find everything at this market. This is Diego Rivera. He's a Mexican artist. You're going to watch a whole film about his now more famous wife, Frida Kahlo, later on, right? You can go down the aisle where they sold dogs. They sold dogs for pets, companion, and food. You could go down the aisle where you can buy pottery, right? And what this kind of realistic image also shows is look at all the, um, there were 35 painted pyramids in Mexico City. Big, huge painted pyramids. Isn't that incredible? Mexico City was also home to a ball court. This ball court's the one in the Yucatan Peninsula town of Chichen Itza probably one of the biggest, but you get an idea. Throughout, Mexi throughout Mesoamerica, uh, folks played this ball game with this big rubber ball about yay big, and they hit it with their hips, and they, some historians say they tried to get it through the loop, some historians say no, they just kind of played like a soccer type thing, right? We really don't know what we really don't know about their ball courts, but what we do know is that ball courts are all over the place. There's thousands of these things. This ball court right underneath the main cathedral, here's the main cathedral in Mexico City, right over here, was just excavated in 2017. So it's really cool. We're still learning more and more things about um, the, this Mexican culture, right? Here's um, 
part of the ball court. <clears throat> we talked about the calendar. The Maya and the Aztec had two kinds of calendars, kind of like we do. Um, we have a solar calendar, right? And today is called August, what do we call it? August 25th, 2020, right? And our calendar started when? Our current uh, Gregorian calendar. When do we start it? 2020? What happened 2020 years ago according, according to our calendar? You all know I'm just picking on you. What's our calendar based on? What's year zero? Jesus being born. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, um, the, the birth of Jesus. Uh, historians now think he was born three years earlier, but that doesn't matter. This Polish monk uh, made up the year in about 1400 or so. But it's stuck. We're in the year 2020. The Maya calendar, their year zero goes back 3,100 years ago. That's the Maya year zero and the Aztec year zero. So again, I could go on and on about this calendar. It really gets me too excited, but I won't. Um, if anybody has any questions, just ask. Um, let me talk about the Aztec social contract. I got about, um, I think 50, you, you all are good for 15 more minutes? Oh yeah. All right, good. Um, so the Aztec social contract, let me ask you all, what's our social contract with our government? In other words, what are us as citizens supposed to give our government and what are we supposed to get in return in an ideal world? Are you talking about America specifically or a government in general? Oh, America specifically, government in general, just in general. Justin, go ahead and shoot from the hip, that's fine. Compliance and protection. So we're supposed to get, we're supposed to comply to the laws that we agree to, right? Mm -hmm. And if we do comply and obey the laws, we will be protected by the system we've agreed to. Is that what you're getting at? Yeah. Yeah. And what else do we give our, um, our government? Access. Taxes, right? We fund the money, right? As a community college professor, over almost 35% of my paycheck goes to paying for I-5 renovations yet again and schooling and, and everything else and my salary. Um, taxes, uh, what else do we give the government? What's the ultimate sacrifice we can give? Well, service in general to whatever it is. It could be life or death. Yeah. So we give our body if necessary, we give compliance to laws we agree upon, and we give taxes, right? And in return, the government's supposed to protect us from foreign enemies within and without, right? And protect us um, and provide for the general welfare, like the garbage service delivery I get every Thursday morning, things like that, and schools and whatever we agree upon and argue about. This is something that we argue about every day, right? But I'm just getting the basic thing out there. So let me tell you about the Aztec social contract. <clears throat> so the subjects, right, they're not citizens, they're subjects. This is no democracy. No democracies are around in the world at this time whatsoever. So the subjects had to be loyal, pay tax, and fight. And if the subjects did all of these things, oh, for example, here, just to show you the sophistication, here's an Aztec tax sheet that was, that was paid once every 80 days, the tax guy had come around. And this one town had to provide, this town is like county, this is like Shasta County. Their version of Shasta County had to provide all these things. One big raptor, an aguila. See that word aguila? Uh, that means eagle. This town apparently had really good costume makers or uniform makers. So every 80 days they had to have this outfit for this elite warrior, this one for the Jaguar warrior, right, etc. They had to provide this quantity of corn. Do you see that white grain up in there? That's corn. And this quantity of what do you think the black thing is in there? Beans. 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 Once again, remember, remember, remember. Their food, corn, bean, squash, corn, bean, squash, a lot along with Tomato, avocado, pumpkin, chili. Oh, yummy Mexican food. I'm getting hangry. All right, where are we? 
So isn't that cool? And doesn't that show you the level of philosophy, um, sophistication? Quick question. Do they have like limes and cilantro a lot as well? I didn't see it mentioned, but it's something synonymous yeah, today with limes. Mexican food. I think limes are from the Middle East. Somebody Google limon at limes. I think limes come from the Middle East, but that's a great question. Who asked that question? Was that Justin? Yeah, it's just because it's more synonymous with our modern day Mexican food. So I was curious when they got it, kind of. Ooh, that's a good question. Um, you know what? That's why I love this book. This book, Que Viven Los Tamales, Food and the Making of Mexican Identity. This is a look at Mexican history through food. And you know what? My guess is going to be that the Spanish, through their Muslim influence, brought the limes over. But somebody Google, origins of limes. Where do they come from? Asia. Asia, okay. Yeah, Southeast Asia, like Indonesia. Okay, okay. so you're right. See, Justin? Globalized economy. Salsa y limon, that comes from, that's a result of the encounter between Eurasians and Mexicans. <clears throat> So when we look back at American history and we go, man, the IRS, don't they suck? Well, they provide a useful job, but the Mex Mexicans also had their IRS and there they are. Oh, and they had to provide fish. See the fish? Like tilapia or something like that. Uh, the Mexica royalty, we'll talk more about Montezuma and the elite, the culture of the elite next time. But the Mexica had a huge zoo in downtown, in the downtown capital and a huge aviary. They had 300 people taking care of their zoo and aviary. Aviary is a big cage where birds live. Montezuma and the Aztecs loved themselves some exotic animals. And, um, and more on this later. So what does the Spanish conquistador Hernan Cortes do when he rolls into town just to show him who's boss? Freaking burns it all up. Dude, man. Um, another Brief example about the sophistication of Aztec culture is the duties of priests and warriors were spelled out specifically, right? If you read these texts, and these are just one page out of these voluminous books that the, that the Aztecs had, okay? Here is the job of a warrior, right? And here's the job of a priest, okay? They had, they had it lined out what, the ch what children are supposed to do. They had gendered jobs, right? Who do you think this is here sweeping? Is this a boy or a girl whose job it was to sweep? Who do you think is doing the sweeping? Girls. Yeah, right. They had gendered jobs for them to do, right? The, the boys had to go out and... Um, gather wood, right? And here are the boys out there fishing using a weir. Here's a woman down here um, making a grinding corn on the comal. And here's a woman sewing on, I forget the name. What's the name of this thing in English again? Zoom. Anyway, this sewing thing. I forget the name in English. Plume. Plume? Oh yeah, plume, plume is the little thing you throw back and forth. Oh, plume. Loom, that's right, loom, loom, loom. And the pluma is the thing they throw back and forth. Okay, got it, the loom. Oh, they also had poetry. <clears throat> Emma, can I pick on you to, oh, that's the name of the biggest market, Mesa. In, um, the biggest suburb that has 4 million people, a suburb of Mexico City, is called Neza Huacoyoto. It's named after this poet. Uh, I don't want to pick on Emma. Does anybody want to read some Aztec poetry? I can do it. <laughs> it. Emma, let's share some Aztec poetry with us. And of course, it sounds better the, in, in the original Nahua. Go ahead, Emma. Our house on earth we do not inhabit, only borrow it briefly. So be splendid princes. Here only our heart sings briefly, briefly lent to one another. Earth is not our last home. So take these flowers and be splendid princes. Be splendid princes. Thank you, Emma. Oh, isn't that cool? Right? Doesn't this show you that the, well, what does this say to you about Aztec culture? The fact that they had poetry like this. And believe me, I could really bore you with a lot of, of Nesa Huacoyotl poetry, but I won't. Yeah, Dita, what does this tell you about their culture if they had all these IRS. That they believe in an afterlife. Right, exactly. They had a worldview and an ask, 
right? The Earth is uh, like uh, they they kind of have this very temporary idea of uh, like basically civilization and life on Earth. Yeah. Yeah, it's so human, isn't it? So human. I love it. All right. So next time you all want to woo somebody in this COVID life we're living, break out some Nezawa Koyotu. All right. And throw some original Nawa words in there. Woo, that will get you far. And um, do you see the coyote up here speaking in his ear? Right? This is an image of the poet. Very cool. Here's another one. I'll let you look on this if you want um, later. You can also hear it in the original Nawa right here at this YouTube link. I'll just let that stay. <clears throat> so, yeah, about five more minutes, and then I'm going to open it up to questions. Um, what strikes you about Mexica or Aztec culture and its influence on North American Indians? So check this out. You know how Europeans, many Europeans value gold and other things, but I'll just pick on gold. Um, this was the equivalent of gold to Aztec folks, the feather of the Quetzal bird, this long, long plume that adorned the tail feather of the Quetzal bird, because they would make the Aztec royalty would wear their headdresses made from this bird. Very gorgeous, it's translucent. If you saw it in real life, it'll just like blow you away. These images don't give it justice. So check this out though. The birds are in the south, in Guatemala, south of where they live. The Aztec were wonderful jade workers as well. Look at this jade. This is a funerary mask when somebody important died. They made a mask for their face, a lot like Egyptians did, a lot like many other cultures did, Vikings, etc. Here's a funerary mask for the Aztecs. These are, right, jade, jade, jade. Isn't that incredible? But the jade comes from, because we can take a little bit about it and find out the exact cave where this jade comes from, because it has a fingerprint. Isn't that crazy? This jade, comes from the Southwest in modern day New Mexico. Isn't that crazy? And the feathers come from way down here in Guatemala. What does that tell you, Carol, Justin, Emma, Yadira, or Lee? What does that tell you about, I don't know, life back then? They had huge trade routes that uh, spanned pretty much uh, all across, uh, all into North America. Oh my gosh, don't even say, yep, here is a map of trade routes. So even though they didn't have I-5 or Swift trucking or any of that stuff, or the Amazon or the FedEx, they were trading with each other, okay? Uh, Pochtecas, Pochteca is the name, the Aztec name for the traders. And they didn't have horses or any beasts of burden, so it was just dudes, mostly dudes, once in a while women, walking with backpacks on. Walking, 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 right? Um, and trading. You all are going to be reading about, I'm sorry, you're going to listen to a 17-minute podcast talking about this double-headed serpent, another piece of artisanal work the Aztecs made. These are actual teeth right here that they put in this double-headed serpent. The double-headed serpent is one of the most important icons of Aztec, of Mesoamerican life, not just Aztec. All right, so cool. Look at this trade networks. So the Aztecs were by far the wealthiest and most sophisticated peoples at this time. So not surprisingly, their influence went north, especially to people in the eastern United States, what we call the Mississippi Valley people in here, the Mississippi Mound Builder folks. Um, the Mississippi Mound Build culture, Mississippi um, watershed culture, the biggest city of the, of, in North America at the time was Cahokia, right? Cahokia is right near modern day St. Louis, right at modern day St. Louis. But all these little dots and squares refer to significant populations of Mississippi culture people all around here. <clears throat> the Cahokia at its height between 900 and 1400 um, AD had about 40,000 people. That's about what the size of Red Bluff or about half the size of Redding today. There were a miss here's the Mississippi River over here, but they had canals, right? Um, they had, this is their city grid, right? If you took a drone view of what Cahokia looked like, here's where, here's the walled city and here's where all the farmers and like here are the suburbs where the farmers and people lived. 
Here's a ceremonial site over here. But this is where the important people lived, inside the walled city. <clears throat> the internal walled city was about six square miles, about the size of like four Shasta College campuses put together, like the whole property. And they were, um, interestingly, the pyramids, or these sacred, yeah, their pyramids were built along solar and lunar lines and angles. When I say that, what do I mean? That they architecturally built these pyramids along solar and lunar lines. What do I mean by that? Anybody? They built their architecture based on solar and lunar. I'm using, I'm not getting my words correct. Emma, help me out. Or Carol or Justin. Uh, I guess maybe that uh, if you were standing in the middle of it, you'd see the sun uh, rise from uh, one pyramid and set in the other. And exactly. same with the moon, perhaps. Yeah, thank you for bailing me out there, Lee. Um, so um, in the summer solstice or the winter solstice or where there was a full moon, like the harvest moon, things would line up perfectly. Okay, isn't that cool? These buildings would line up perfectly. The light would shine in their observatory. They built an observatory perfectly on the summer solstice and the winter solstice. It would shine in perfectly this way. So they knew their astronomy. They knew their lunar and solar lines. You know what? This is exactly a replica of, a blueprint of, Frickin' this city, Teotihuacan, in Mexico City, near Mexico City. Same, same grid, right? They copied and pasted the, the blueprint. This is in a much more massive scale, and they use stone. This is a replica because they used earth, earth and timber, which doesn't last, right? It eroded, it eroded down, but we still have ele um, evidence of it. This is still around. If you ever go visit Mexico City, it's a quick 45 minute bus drive. You can walk down here. Make sure you get a big hat and a popsicle because it's a really hot walk over to here. Get a little paleta and you can come up here to the Pyramid of the Sun right here. And you can look over on the Pyramid of the Moon. Same, same thing as the place in Cahokia. So in other words, this place in far off what is today St. Louis shared food, shared geographic designs, um, shared architecture with the folks way down here in Mesoamerica. By the way, the first corn crop, was it 5,000? Yeah, 5,000 years ago is when humans first said, oh wow, look at this small little grass. It has a kernel of corn. Let's take that biggest kernel and plant it. Corn is a completely GMO, uh, genetically modified organism by humans from 5,000 years ago. What do I mean by that? Without human intervention, picking that corn out of the, tearing off the ear, picking the biggest one and planting it, corn would not exist without our help, right? The ears of the corn would just smother the seeds and it wouldn't exist. So in addition to borrowing from their architectural style, the Cahokia also ate the triad, corn, beans, and squash, and had pumpkins. So did the pilgrims. I'm sorry, so did the um, Wampanoag, who the pilgrims met up in Plymouth, corn, beans, and squash. Same, same exact food regimen. Interesting, right? With that, I'm going to stop and open it up for questions, comments. Or what my favorite thing to do is ask you, what struck you about this lecture that maybe you didn't know or what's just sticking with you? And I'll just go across my, my screen from bottom to top. Justin, what stuck with you about my discussion? Or if you have any questions. Um, I came in late. Honestly, I didn't realize it was today. So that was my mistake. Um, but when I saw the link, I, I jumped on. Because I thought we were doing it Monday for some reason. I guess that was just my mistake. You know what? I, about a week ago, I changed it. No, remember, it's not you. It's always me. Um, I changed it up for reasons you not get into. So does this time work for you, 1.30 on Tuesdays? This works better for me personally because I don't work today and I usually would have had left through half of the lecture because I work about halfway through the lecture usually. Yeah. Okay, for so some- So it works better for me. Hey, I'm happy to start it at two, that's fine. I don't care. 
anyway, we'll we'll talk about that maybe at the afternoon uh, office meeting. Oh, that's fine. Um, but what struck me about this one that I was at, the part that I did attend, um, I guess I didn't know as much about the squash that they ate. I knew about corns and beans because I know that you have to get a complete protein, and I knew that both are required. Yep. Um, yep. And then you called them pyramids, which is a little different because I remember them called ziggurats. Oh, for some reason back in the day, and I didn't really know the distinction between the two. I know they have similar shape, but uh, that was the one thing that was kind of weird to me is that I, I, I remember them being referred more to ziggurats than as uh, pyramids in okay. South America. Yeah, I got you. Yeah, I have a uh, pyramids is the, I don't know the Nawa word for pyramid. I'll look it up though. Yeah, it's basically the simplest. If you go out and get a big old pile of rock and dump it, what shape is it going to do? I like a pyramid shape. So it seems like the most efficient way to pile rocks up. Um, thank you, Justin. Um, Carol, I hear you. <laughs> oh no. Carol's keyboard got baptized. Oh, Carol, let's bless your keyboard. <laughs> so I don't know if you can speak or type. I'm sorry about your keyboard. Here's COVID life right there. Her son baptized the laptop. Oh, isn't that a COVID story if there ever was one? Oh, Lord. So Carol, I don't know if you can hear or see, but if you have something to share, please uh, chime in. Grr, she says, oh, it's not working. So I'll move to uh, Emma. Hello, Emma, what um, what struck you about today's chit chat? Um, I think just like how huge the trade routes were and not just like from an economic standpoint and like trade goods, but how they like shared ideas and like culture was also shared along the trade routes. I thought that was super interesting. Exactly. Just like in the world history class you had with me last semester, how um, Mongols uh, shared Chinese arms technology with Europeans and they both, you know, shared technology and came up eventually with how to make steel and how to make better um, military uh, equipment. No, thank you, Emma. You're right. Sharing is caring, right? Us humans, that's how we, that's how we do it, right? If we were out in the wild, we would get eaten by grizzlies like that. If we didn't together figure out, hey, let's make bear spray, let's make a gun, right? So if we didn't figure out how to work together, if we didn't work together, mm -mm, it wouldn't work. That whole thing about the Lone Ranger all by himself on a horse, total not true. All right, Yadira, let me uh, come to you if you don't mind. Any old thing. Um, I was also kind of surprised about the trade routes, especially the, the fact that they walked that far. Like, yeah. that's crazy. I mean, were there buffalo back then? They could have ridden a buffalo. I don't know. But I, I always knew that horses are not native to the Americas. So it's really interesting to see that they walked all that they for did. trade. Um, you're right. It wasn't one guy walking the whole way. You had your route, the pochteca they called. So say I was a pochteca. I would go from here to Dunsmere. Right, and then I'd hand my thing off to uh, Justin, and Justin go from Dunsmere to Mount Shasta. You know what I mean? So they'd take turns. It wasn't just like one guy. And you're right, they couldn't domesticate the bison. Bison, imagine trying to ride a bison. Uh-uh, no, you would be gored or something bad would happen to you. Yeah, it wasn't until the domesticated cattle and sheep and, um, Horses came, were their big animals domesticated. Are cows native too? No, cows came from Europe. <clears throat> oh, okay. Yep. <clears throat> yep. Yeah. All the domesticated pigs, cows, sheep, horses, all came from Eurasia. You'll see next time the biggest animal that went the other way was the turkey, the wahulote, the turkey. The now you can go to the center of Africa in some little Bantu village and like, oh, they're having a turkey dinner. You're like, dang. America, right? So turkeys went the other way. And so did tomatoes. There was no tomatoes, chocolate, vanilla, chilies in anywhere else in the world until the Europeans brought it back. Not crazy. Was... Go ahead, Lee. And yeah, what's your uh, take on things? Oh, um, I'm just, I, I, have a, I have a lot of interest in Aztec history, so I'm just having a good time. Oh, cool. You know what, uh, Carol, who got her keyboard baptized, was amazed at, let me go back to this picture, that 250,000 people lived on this little chunk of land. You know what, that's actually a very big chunk of land. It's hard to get the, the scope of it. 
but Mexico City today encompasses this whole thing. Oh, I'm not sharing my screen, am I? Am I sharing my screen? So 250,000 people on this, it's very densely populated, plus this is a lot bigger than you think. Today, Mexico City encompasses this whole thing. The only thing left of the lake because they drained it is right down here, Xochimilco. This little kind of cutesy place where couples go and row boats and right, look sweet at each other. So the rest of this is all drained. And this is why you've heard of Mexico City earthquakes. When the earth shakes in Mexico City, it's like on a big bowl of jello. This is all just an old lake bed. So unlike New York, when New York gets hit by an earthquake, it's granite. It just goes like, <clears throat> if Mexico City gets hit by an earthquake, jello, like this, brrr, and it just shakes and shakes and shakes. Yeah, they have that big disaster, like. Sorry. No, it's OK. Uh, they had this big disaster like 40 years ago when like this entire uh, big uh, neighborhood of apartment buildings just completely collapsed during one of those. Yeah, four years ago, 1985, they had one. They have them all the time, all the time, all the time. That's why um, if you go to a lot of cities in Mexico, they're built low and fat just so they don't move, right? Low and chunky, just so you don't move. <sighs> they can take it. <clears throat> Um, I'm going to, we can continue, but I'm going to stop recording because it's just going to.